I want to introduce this morning by, by taking a couple of moments to, to give an aside. We are in this series called We're In This Together. It's a series on discipleship, and right now we're in volume two of it, talking about practices of disciples, good practices that make us good disciples. We are coming into the Christmas season, though, and I really feel a, a, a need to be speaking a little bit about restoring the awe, the wonder, the beauty of Christmas to us all, because frankly, society around us has done pretty much all it can just to drag that childlike response that we have to the Christmas season uh, out of us. And I'm, I'm feeling like we need to go back and visit the, the scriptures a little bit when it comes to just the, the incredible things that God was doing for us when he sent Jesus to the earth. So the series itself is going to get a little bit messed up. And, and uh, even though I can never actually promise you that I know where we're going, uh, I will tell you this, that it's, it's a desire on my heart to continue in the practices when we get through the, the Christmas season to, the, and get into the new year to talk to you about things like weaponizing your worship, talking to you about the five different levels of worship and praise, talking to you about prayer and the five different kinds of prayer that we have at, at our disposal, and, and then talking to you about the issue of fasting and how important it is, not, not that it's a, a sort of an elective, but something we're all supposed to do in our lifetime to, to literally cement the things of the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to see some of that this morning of the power of fasting uh, when it comes to bringing us to a place of no longer doubting that God can just do the absolute impossible uh, for us if we just stand in faith believing. Amen? So I just wanted you to know where we're going, because today I'm going to add um, one, one new aspect to the discipleship uh, series, and we're going to talk about the practice of, of being emotionally prepared for spiritual warfare. You see, no one, no one can be called a good disciple unless you are engaged in spiritual warfare. Now, there are a lot of Christians who just want to be blessed, they want to worship, they want to sing, they want to pray for people, uh, but when it comes to the issue of spiritual warfare, this kind of want to stay away from that because it's too messy. But I want to tell you something, warfare for the souls of men is a very real thing. And, and it, is, it is oftentimes very hardcore. And you and I need to be prepared, especially in light of what's taking place in our county right now. Let me just tell you what's going on in a, in a thumbnail, uh, maybe for more development later. In our South County area, we now have, we now have a, a new pagan, pagan cult that is rising in our midst. Uh, they're getting sort of bold ab about their presence now, and, and they are letting, kind of letting Christians know that we are here and we're not going anywhere. Uh, there are a couple of operating cults, New Age cults, that have begun showing themselves in very, very strong ways. As a matter of fact, we just heard this morning between services from a firsthand account of, of a gal who was at a church, a Christian church, where they had her sit and they, they spun an amulet on the end of a chain around her, and wherever it stopped was the answer, yes or no. I want you to know that there is absolutely nothing in the Scripture at all that would verify or authenticate that, and in fact, there's a lot in the Scripture that would say that that is a demonic activity, has nothing to do with the body of Christ, nothing to do with the gospel whatsoever. There are churches in South County that where people, they're being infiltrated, the Bible's clear about that, that the wolves come to spy out the freedom and the liberty that we have as believers, and what they're looking for is they're looking for fringers who they can pull away to, to sort of people to populate their, their, little, their little activities. And I want you to know we've been visited here, and be, because of who we are and how we stand, um, I had the opportunity to confront one, uh, one young man who was trying to bring some, was looking for people that he could hook with some new age theology, uh, and we put a stop to that immediately. Uh, we had another guy who was involved in the, who k tried to, to make it an in ingress into the men's group, and that was shut down by, by our guys there. Uh, we've had a, a few other instances where our leadership stepped in, and we were able to, to stop whatever was the intended, uh, the intended purposes, but the reality of of it is, is that things like that don't really work well here because we don't literally, we don't give opinions. We stand on the Word of God. We speak about the Word of God, and that's never going to be compromised. Are we together? 
I want to tell you that this is an hour when you and I, as disciples, need to be prepared for spiritual warfare, and that can be a frightful thing, and I want to remove all of that from you today by speaking to you from the Word of God. Now, so far in our series, we've talked about a couple of really important things when it comes to dealing with the issues of our personal ministries in the real world. And you realize that that's what you were left behind for, right? You weren't left behind to go to church one time a week, two times a week, to feel all good and, 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 and fuzzy about yourself and to be blessed by God. You were left behind to go to war for the souls of mankind. You were left behind to bring your families, your friends, your acquaintances, your mission fields, where you work, where you go to school, all of that. You were, you were left here to have a pow positive, powerful effect there. Are we together? So we found out then if we're going to have good ministries, if we're going to be good disciples, that we had to start by building strong families so that we have a, a foundation or a, a foundation to stand on. We saw in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, that God de desired for all ministry to flow from the family foundation. He gave the man and the woman dominion over all the things of the earth. That is rulership. That is an outflow of ministry. And that's what God intended, that all ministry would flow from families. Then we saw this very important thing, that that includes all singles of all varieties. That no matter who you are, no matter who we are, not only do we have our, our, our flesh and blood families where we're supposed to have strong ties, but we also are called to have strong families in the church as well. So no matter who we are, no matter where we are, we have connections where we can build strong families so that from the foundation of a family, from the foundation of co-rulership, we're able to minister effectively to the world around us. Are we together? And the Bible said this, we studied this and saw that by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And one of that love is between a husband and a wife, between parents and children, uh, between uh, people and friends or brothers and sisters in Christ, that our love for one another is where we, is the root of where we build strong families to operate from. Amen. Then after we saw that, and it was sort of weird to start with the family as the foundation, but after we saw that that was where God wanted all things to flow from, then we took a look at the, at the actual site work of our, of our foundation in Christ. If the foundation is strong families, then, then the site work on which we build, the good foundation, is the Word of God, right? Nothing happens for a believer that doesn't first start with the Word of God. It all has to come from the Word. It is the, the, the site that we build on. It is the preparation. We put the foundation of good, strong family ties, whether it's at home or in the church, but it's all built and based on the Word of God. It's the Word of God that carries the promises to be partakers of the divine nature of God. It's the Word of God that tells us everything we wanted to know about life. It's all there in the book. Everything is right there in the Bible for you and I to mine. Amen? We were told and we saw, uh, studied, we saw that we were to make speed to know what's in the Word of God, not to dilly-dally with it, not to, to, to just sort of play with the Word of God, but that we were to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. You see, if you're just a, a person who takes in the Word of God, who familiarizes yourself with the Word of God, all you are is an information bank. And we were never called to be information banks. We were called to be people who were empowered by the Word of God, who went about doing good and destroying all the works of the devil. That is hard world encounter. That is what the real world looks like. You and I engaging the, the enemy at levels where he has people bound and we are there to fight for the quality of their souls. Say amen if you believe me. Amen. So, Jesus said this, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and when the storms came, it didn't fall because its foundation was on the rock. And we want to be people who are living in a stormy society who have absolutely nothing to fear about our house caving in, about our ministries caving in, because we know who we are and we're built on a firm foundation. And we learned all that we've learned to this point, where we learned it from? The Word of God. Anything that we're going to find out about God is going to come from the Word of God. So that has to be the foundation on which we build. Now, the Word of God is really clear about hard world, what we're going to call hard world encounters. 
They're not comfortable. Many Christians shy away from hard world encounters. And as a matter of fact, if things start getting a little messy, if things start, if, if, if the level starts rising a little bit, things get a little tense, some Christians will just do this. They'll just say, I see that and I'm going to walk away as quietly and smoothly as I can. And that's not what you and I were left here to do. You and I were left here to do spiritual warfare, and we need to understand it from the Word of God. So I'm going to take you through some scriptures. We're going to look at the text, and then we're going to wind up with the final point at the end so that we are emotionally prepared. Good disciples are emotionally prepared for spiritual warfare. Are we together? Okay. With his words uh, that Jesus spoke and uh, with their new family ties, the early disciples went out preaching and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, and we want to be the same way because good discipleship means that we prepare for spiritual warfare and hard world encounters. Look at this scripture. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. That word that's there for schemes is the word that we get the English word strategies from. And I want you to know that the devil has very long-term plans, has had them from the foundation of the creation of man. And we see that throughout the Scripture of how the day is coming when there will be an apostasy in the church, the church will be weakened, and the son of lawlessness will rise, and he will bring anarchy to the world that is only withheld by the remnant of the believers that are left holding the line. And these strategies we're beginning to see are emerging like never before in our society. As a matter of fact, you can't go a day anymore, not even a day, without hearing something either from the media or, I mean, social media or television or wherever your, your feeds come from. You can't go a day without hearing something that absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. I want to give you a tip off. If things that you begin to see happening in the world don't make sense, it's because it is not worldly, it is coming out of a realm of darkness, and that's the whole point, is that it doesn't make sense. People buy into the deception, and all of a sudden we have our, find ourselves being weakened, being deluded, and anarchy taking the place where Christians are supposed to be standing. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. Look at this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, and powers of this world's darkness and the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, I, I, I've got to just stop for a moment and, and, and reiterate the first part of that. There are people in all of our lives that we're going to encounter or that we are already encountering. Anybody here been offended by a human being lately? Anybody here been on the road lately? Anybody been in a Walmart shopping line? We all have people in our lives that will bring offenses into our lives. And I want you to understand something. That tells us plainly, it's not the people who are our problem. And every minute you spend railing against another human being, you are wasting time doing business where it counts and seeing the people who are becoming your offender delivered and walking in freedom. We are here to help people walk in freedom. When a person is aggressively working against you, here's what I want you to know first of all. They believe in their cause. They believe what they're doing is right. They believe that their confrontation against you is a just cause because most people, if they're in their right mind, only do what they believe in. Now, if what they believe in doesn't make any sense, if you say, well, that's just ridiculous, none of that's even true. If that's the case, then you can know without any shadow of a doubt that there's a spiritual strategy at work through them and they're not your enemy. So stop. Stop with the Facebook rants. Stop, stop with the, the, the mean, ugly texts. The people are not our problem. Our problem is rulers, authorities, and powers of this world's darkness and spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms that are working the motto of their father. What's the motto of their father? Steal, kill, and destroy. 
bring as much misery as possible into people's lives. Offend everybody. Slander everyone. That's the motto. That's how they operate. And when you and I go to war against the people, they just sit back and laugh because they're not affected at all by your railing and fighting with human flesh. They're only affected when a person stands up in faith and says, no more. You are done using that person to bring darkness in my life. Now, from this particular text, I want you to see something. First of all, demon powers and the demon activity are not the explanations of ancient primal people for bad psychological de decisions. See, we, we're very condescending in our modern society. We think we're so smart, so advanced. We're no more advanced than anybody. In fact, Adam and Eve were the perfect models of humanity. And since that second generation, things have been devolving all along. Our technology is higher. But we're not sharper than they were. We're not smarter than, than they were. We're not more in touch than Adam and Eve were with God. Are we together? So the things that we see in the Scripture, some people say, well, you know, they were just ancient people. They weren't as smart as we are. And so what they did, Siri, was they blamed the bad stuff that they couldn't really explain too well because they didn't have the, the sociological, psychological babble that we do. So when they, when they were trying to explain, they said, the devil made me do it. Are we together? Demon activity is real. It is not just some made-up excuse for poor behavior from the past. It's a hard reality of our broken world that Adam and Eve gave it away to the adversary. Demon power and activity was validated by Jesus in his word. In fact, he spent almost his entire time, he was in three years of ministry, battling with people who were operating under the influence of spirits. Some of them were demon-possessed, and it was easy to figure it out. Oh, that guy wiggling on the ground, that's demon possession. But there were people in the temple who were railing against him, who were angry for no reason whatsoever. It didn't make any sense that they would want to kill the one who was doing miracles. They were under the influence of demons. And you won't find Jesus railing against them. Jesus just trusting his Father just moving ahead in his ministry the entire time. He tried to bring them to reality. He tried to wake them up. Sometimes it worked. We see in cases that some of the leadership followed after him. And in most cases, it didn't work because they were under the influence of spirits and, and there was nothing that was breaking them free of that. Demons, we have them here. We have them in our schools. We have them in our business offices. We have them in our, our work, our plants. We have them on the street. We have them in the marketplace. And what you see is not the tip of an iceberg, but the chip off an iceberg. Anytime that you see some demonic activity going on, no matter what it is, it's just a small little tiny chip. It's not the tip. See, when you say you have a tip of an iceberg, <clears throat> a tip of an iceberg can be the size of a mountain. But we know that no matter what we see, there's a whole lot more underneath it. Well, I want you to know this, that whatever you see of the demonic world manifesting, there is spiritual darkness in heavenly places all focused in on that same spot. So it's the chip of the iceberg, and good disciples need to understand the reality of it and need to know what to do with it. Are we together so far? So. Luke chapter 10, Jesus takes us to another level. I'm going to talk about this, this issue of spiritual warfare. He says, go your ways. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs, lambs among wolves. Hey, wait, 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 Jesus, wait. Wait a minute. Can you back up there? Can you say, I think you said that wrong. I, I think you meant to say, I'm sending you out as wolves among sheep because you're going to win. No, wait, and Jesus said, no, no, that's not what I said. I'm sending you out, here comes the sales job, guys. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Isn't that great? Go get them, lamby pie. <laughs> now, now, first of all, let me just say this, that, that if, if we're called lambs in comparison to their wolves, they're just regular old wolves, and we look like Arnold Schwarzenegger with a big bazooka in the realm of the Spirit. You have no idea how you've been equipped. We're going to see that today. No idea how you've been equipped, but you have everything you need. So if Jesus sent us out as lambs among wolves, you're okay. It's not a great sales job, 
doesn't play well in, in TV ads, but the reality of it is we're okay. Here's the proof. And they went. He sent them out, and they went, and they returned, saying, Lord, even devils are subject to us through your name. And he said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give to you power. And the word inserted there is exousia, and it means privilege. Catch these words. Privilege, force, capacity, competency, delegated influence, freedom, mastery. Pretty good words, right? Jurisdiction, strength over all the power of the enemy. But he changes the word power here from exousia to the word dunamis, and it means I've given you authority, capacity, competency, uh, superiority over all the ability, all the might, the mighty deeds, the miracle working power which comes to deceive over all the regular power, over all the strength, all the violence. And I've given you the power to tread on serpents. Now, now, we're not snake handlers. The language is figurative, and, and please don't anybody say, well, you know, I'm just going to step on some snakes. You need to have big faith for those bites. It's figurative language talking about malicious poisoners, and you can tread on scorpions, which figuratively means people who are stinging you, who are, who are biting you, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means will hurt you. So I want you to understand this, <clears throat> from this, this particular text, all power and authority has been transferred to us. Would you read that? All power and authority has been transferred to us. That's an important phrase. It's a game-changing phrase, and I'll show you at the very end. So that power, as we saw it in the Scripture, that power superior to all the power of the enemy, we have exousia over all the dunamis that he has, even the signs and wonders kind. Now, when cults begin to function, you have to understand that there are going to be signs and wonders that cause people to wonder about the sign. And they're going to go, well, no, this must be God because it's just so incredible. I mean, there's, there's peace and there's, there's so much stuff. Listen, any cult that's in operation that can't use the name of Jesus is something for you and I to flee from. The works that are done, if, they're, if they can't be spoken out in Jesus' name, you need to run. Are you hearing me? So there, the Bible's clear. Jesus told us deceivers are going to come in my name, and they're going to be doing these works that are going to deceive even the very elect, if it's possible. Well, I want to be part of the elect who are not deceived, because we are going to make sure that we try every spirit to see what sort it is. And if it's not based on the Word of God, if it's not based on the name of Jesus, if it's not functioning by the power of the Holy Spirit, if I can't find it in the Word of God, like the little amulet twirl, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm walking away as fast as I can from that mess because it's not godly. Are we on the same page? So, even with this transferred authority, you said it with your own words, there can be breakdowns. I want to share from the Word of God what some of those breakdowns are so that we can be good disciples who are emotionally prepared for spiritual warfare. So here's the first one. Jesus is speaking. This is actually the case of the man whose son is thrown in the fire. He's come, Jesus has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. There's this big hubbub going on with his disciples and the man and his, and his boy. And the man has tried to have the disciples help him, and they have been powerless to deliver this little boy of this demon spirit. And the man says to Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering, suffering terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. It's one thing or the other, Lord. We just walk by something, and we find him, he's falling in the fire. It's horribly disfiguring. We, we, we're on our way to someplace, and the devil will, will throw him, this demon will throw him in the water, try to drown him. We're always near death, no matter where we are. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. Oh, ugh. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. How long must I remain with you? Speaking to his own guys, how long must I put up with you? Ah, oh, Jesus, I don't want that to be said of us. Uh-uh, uh-uh, show me the way out. Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the boy, the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. 
Afterward, the disciples came to Jesus privately, uh-huh, I get it, and asked, why couldn't we drive that spirit out? Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. Couldn't you have said something else? Why did you have to go there, Jesus? Why couldn't we get rid of that demon? Because you have so little faith. For truly, I tell you, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you, but this kind doesn't move except by prayer and fasting. Now, I want to set you free of something that the body of Christ has been laboring under for generations. Take note. Take note that Jesus did not go and pray and fast to get that demon to come out. He never moved. Can you imagine this? Man says, I brought my son to your boys, and man, it was, it was a service time. They were in there, they're doing all kinds of wonderful things, and I show up with my kid, and I ask them to fix it, and fix him, and they couldn't do anything about it. Jesus says, oh, well, this is, this is pretty big. Tell you what, today, this is, this is Sunday, uh, it, it's, it's mid-morning, I'll, I'll get back to you on Thursday a little bit after lunch. We'll see what we can do then. Does that sound like Jesus at all? He didn't go fast and pray. He didn't say, oh, wow, you know what, this kind of, we got the religious thing going on here. We got to back up. We got to get ourselves revved up. We got to just build up those, those faith muscles. We don't pray and fast to gain ascendancy. You know why? It's already been transferred to us. Amen. You read it yourself. He transferred the power. I give you the power. It's not a matter. The fasting and prayer is not to get ascendancy over demons. Fasting is prayer is to get ascendancy over our doubt that his name will work when we speak it. This is so important to understand. You see, from movies, we get the idea that we have to cloister ourselves away, get down, pray, and get our, our thoughts completely pure, so when we walk in, we just have the power, and we hold up a cross, and we throw water on it, and it's going to depart. There's not an instance in the Scripture where the name of Jesus was not enough. And you need to believe that and understand that. And if you don't believe it, I, I can tell you how to, how to get to believing it. You take some time away to fast and pray. And when you find out that the Lord can support your body supernaturally while you're fasting and praying, you'll begin to believe he can do the impossible because it's impossible for you and I to function properly, to function normally without food and water. And when he shows you what he can do to a man or woman who comes before him in faith to fast and pray and cast out all doubt that he is who he says he is, you'll begin moving mountains and no demon force in hell can stand against you in the name of Jesus when you're exercising it in faith. Amen? They cannot stay. Okay, I'm going to take you one more level. In Acts chapter 19, um, we have the story of that there were some itinerant exorcists. This is a great story. Who tried to invoke the name of Jesus over those with evil spirits. They would say, I bind you by Jesus who Paul proclaims. Seven men were doing this. Eventually, one of the spirits got fed up with all the noise, all the aggravation, and said, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul. Ooh, stop, stop, stop. Every demon that you'll ever encounter in your life, every demonic spirit, every dark spirit, every, every ruler of darkness in heavenly places knows who Jesus is. Can I ask you a question? Do they know who you are? I, I know that they can say this. I know that they can because they're, they're, they watch, they observe. They know everything about you in my life. They, they can say to you, well, I know that you claim his name. I know that you go to church. I know that you follow him as best as you can. But who are you? And that's where the river meets the road. And if you are emotionally prepared for spiritual warfare, you will say, I'll tell you who I am. 
I'm a person whom Jesus has transferred the exousia over all the power of the enemy, and you have to sit down and shut up and get out. Amen. Seven men were doing this. Eventually, one of the spirits said, Jesus, I know, and I know, Paul, who are you? Then the man, I love this, with the evil spirit, jumped on them and overpowered them all. And the attack was so violent, they ran out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to all living in the city, and fear came over all of them. So the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Let's pull something from the text of this, this one thing. Being known and knowing who we are and what we have is vitally important to the name and the honor given to the name of Jesus. A Christian who doesn't know who they are, a Christian who runs from a conflict, a Christian who runs from a contest with a spirit does not bring honor to the name of Christ because we've had the power transferred. It's in your account. If I transferred a million dollars in your account, you wouldn't be going, oh, I, I just have to be good enough to go get it. I have to be, I have to be pure enough to go get it. I have to you would just go get it, right? Okay, it's going to come together in just a second, so hold on with me for one, one more episode here. And in Acts chapter 13, a great thing has just taken place. The disciples have all met. This is now after, the, after the, uh, things have started to calm down, after the persecution of, of Stephen and the dispersion of the, of the church. They're all together, and the, the main leaders of the church are together, and, and the Spirit of God says, separate from me. Uh, uh, Paul, well, Saul, he says, and, uh, and Barnabas. I'm going to send them out on a journey. And they pray, and they fast, and they have the mind of God, and they're worshiping, and now is the time to come. And there's a little boy, little boy named John Mark, and he's a relative of Barnabas. And, and John Mark, I could just see him, I can see him doing this. Uncle, Uncle Barnabas, Uncle Barnabas, could I, could I just go with you guys? I mean, what could be better training for a young man, Barney, than, than to have me be with you and, and see everything firsthand and, and to be there where all the action is? Have you ever been that way? You wanted to be in all the action. And Barnabas says, hey, Paul, what do you think? Paul says, well, you let him come. You take care of him, make sure that he's okay, and, and bring him with you. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went. And the missionary journey starts, and they preach the Word of God. And almost immediately, they came up against a sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And I want you to know that can be pretty stout stuff. This is what you call a hard, a hard world encounter. Right out of the chute on the, on the first journey, they come up against this guy who has made himself famous in the city by doing lying signs and wonders. He was a cult leader. And people honored him because they saw miraculous things they couldn't explain taking place through his life. And Paul, Paul gets a little bit finished with this guy and says, okay, that's it. You know what? You've been a bother enough. So here's what the Spirit of God says. You're going to be blind for a season as a sign that our God is superior to you. And when the people saw what happened to their famed false prophet— they were astonished at the power of God. And the apostles continued naturally. But look what it said. But John Mark took off for home. Here's what I want you to see. Whatever it was, and I'm willing to give, give latitude, and so should you be able to, that what, if it was just the reality and rigors of the mission field, you know, the mission field's tough. The real world is tough. Do you know that? And there's a lot of people who don't want to be in the real world. There's a lot of Christians who don't want to be involved in, in media. They don't want to hear what's going on in the world around them. There's a lot of Christians who don't want to have any confrontations. Oh, dear God, if it gets too crazy, that's, that's not what I signed on for. I just signed on for the, the blessing part. I want, to be, I want to be nice, and, and I want to be graceful. And I want to have sweet friends, really the best friends. And I want to be part of a church that it's all just warriors. Church isn't made for just warriors. Church is made for warriors and people who are just coming into the, the kingdom of heaven. And that can be ugly. There can be some hard world encounter. So maybe it was that. Maybe he just felt, this is just too rough. I'm just too young. I thought I was ready for this, but I'm not ready for this. How about this? It could have been that he was simply young and homesick. I just want to go home and see my mom. Or it could have been, it actually could have been the contest with the demon world. He said, man, this is way more 
than what I bargained for. Whatever it was, he was not emotionally prepared for the hard world encounter. And what he did was he had put his hand to the plow and he started looking back. And as far as Paul was concerned, he was done. One and done. Now here's the good news. God's a restorer. He's a reconciler. This Mark is the same Mark who wrote the gospel. So somewhere down the line, through the process of time, and getting his courage tightened back up, and getting the right perspective, the right, the right emotional perspective on this thing, he became extremely valuable to the kingdom of heaven. So here's my point. No matter what you've done in the past, no matter how you've succeeded or not, just know that God is waiting for you to come back for another shot. And he's willing to equip you again with the word of truth that will cause you to triumph over anything that you have to face in this life. On the same page? Okay, so here's the compendium and the close. First, we live in a real world where much of the spirit side is ignored or feared. And that is, that is the balance of the Christian church. There, there are whole lines of people who do not believe that demons exist, that it's just, a, it's just a figurative language for bad things that happen, and we've seen it clearly. Jesus validates the issues that spirits are real. Same page? Huh? How about this? We must know who sends us and that the power of his name keeps us, right? We're coming back to that in a minute. We must stand in faith believing that no matter what, nothing's impossible with God. Even if it's impossible for us, even if it looks absolutely disastrous for us, it's okay. Nothing's impossible with God, and our stance makes a big difference for the honor of his name, right? Amen. Right? Hang yourself, right? Amen. Here we go. But the contest is real and can appear to be stubborn. It can appear like you're not going to win. Oh, but Siri, you told me that if I, if, I just, if I just believe in my heart, that if I use the name of Jesus, 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 that they'll go. The devil always contests the person exercising their faith. You've had this happen before. Not maybe in this, this death, but here's how it happens to, you, to us all regularly. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do it. The devil says, just stick around a minute. I want to show you something about these people. And I'm not going to do it anymore. And all you got to do is go, just think about it a little bit. What was that? Where did that thought come from? And then we start thinking about, oh, no, no, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. The devil says, Let's just stick around. This is going to be fun. And he goes, dart. Hits you with a dart. And you go, what was that? And we kind of go, oh. Now we dwell a little longer on whatever it was we weren't going to do anymore. And the devil knows he's got you. He knows he's got you. See, he's not, he's not ignorant of our weaknesses. And he knows that we can be, <laughs> I was going to use the word blowhards, but that's a little unkind. We can be full of desire, but not have any ability to follow through. I wonder why that is. Usually when we're dependent upon our own strength, to get something done. We don't have the strength to do this or any of this. So the contest is real and it can be stubborn. Let me just show you what, ha what happened to Jesus here. So they brought the boy uh, and the spirit dropped him to the ground. This is the, the thing we were talking about. The little boy thrown in the fire, thrown in the water. Brought him to the ground, uh, uh, brought the, the, the boy to him and the spirit dropped him to the ground and they began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Now, wait a minute. You can't read that with just like a newspaper. You got to see this. Okay, so, so here is, here's Jesus, he's over here, and, and here's the, the crowd, and, and they're bringing this little, this little boy to, to Jesus, and G they, they, Jesus, uh, he sees Jesus, and Jesus has said, come out of him, and the boy drops to the ground, and now he's foaming at the mouth. Well, right there, most Christians say, oh man, oh, oh, come on, what's going on here? This is someone call 911. This guy needs an ambulance more than he needs me. Jesus spoke, if you believe, all things are possible, and he rebuked the foul spirit, and the spirit cried out. So look, here's a second round of stubbornness. So they bring the boy to, for deliverance, and, and he, he falls on the ground, and this looks bad. This is a hard world encounter. This person is struggling, foaming at the mouth. Jesus speaks, and the foul spirit cries out. Now, I don't know about you. Hold on for a second. 
This is just one human being. Ah! Most Christians are going, oh, oh. And, and you, can, you can be sure it's not like a human sounding shriek. I can't even make a, a scratching on glass chalkboard shriek, shriek like that. The spirit cries out, and not, we're not done yet. And he convulses the boy so that he appears dead. Now, come on, be honest. If you're in this, you know, you brought the boy, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. As soon as they, you see Jesus, man, it's going to be great. Kid's going to walk home with you. He's going to be, he's going to be skipping home. And the kid falls on the ground, wallowing around, foaming at the mouth, all of a sudden shrieking, cr coming out of him, and now he goes totally limp. Most Christians would have walked away by now if they don't know who they are in Christ. They would have said, man, call, the, call one of the pastors over here, get one of the apostles up here on this job. This is way too much for me. I want you to see that in every contest that you have with the Spirit, there's going to be a pause. And the pause is going to see if you're going to stand firm and be found standing still. Amen. Devils never just go at the first, here's an invitation to leave him. Go ahead, little demon, leave him alone now. They're going to be a pause. Let's just see if it, if it plays out in Scripture. How about the Mark chapter 9? Gadarene demoniac. Gadarene. This guy is well known. He's been known for years as a maniac running through cemeteries naked, screaming and yelling. And when people, grown men, went to go get him and strap him down with chains, he'd break the chains and he would, he would beat them up. So the whole city is terrorized by this guy. And Jesus pulls up in a boat. And the demon guy runs at Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but, but when I see this, uh, if I'm standing with Jesus and all of a sudden this big naked running, maniac guy comes running at me, I'm going to be going, hey, man, you got this. You got it, Jesus. Just go for it. <laughs> Jesus totally stands his ground. Now, the spirit, the, the man with the spirit in him, he runs toward Jesus. We aren't told what he was going to try to do. Why is he running at him? You think it was for good purposes? You think he wanted to kiss his feet? But when he gets within reach of him, he falls to the ground completely arrested. And Jesus realizes there's something big going on here, and he's getting ready to give us a great demonstration. And he says to the Spirit, what's your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many you think this is like that other little kid who had one little tiny demon spirit in him? You came for a, the, to the wrong person, buddy, because you think this was going to be easy? We've got thousands of us in here. Jesus didn't go, oh, no. What are we going to do? Guys, start to pray. Start fasting right now. <laughs> Jesus said, you come out of them. And he came out. I want you to know that the name of Jesus is plenty to get rid of any spirit that has set up camp in the realm where you influence. Another man in the temple had an unclean spirit. And, it, and when it had torn him, after Jesus had spoken, come out of him, it had torn him, thrown him down the ground, cried out, there's that shriek again. But he came out. I want you to see conclusively. The name of Jesus is enough. In all cases, Jesus stood his ground, and we can too. But there's one last problem, one last problem. And here it is. Brings the whole thing together in culmination. I know who you are. Jesus, I know. And I know who you are. And I'm going to ask you a question. Who do you think you are telling me to go? You're unholy as I am. I've seen, I saw what you did last night. I heard you. I heard you when you use those terrible words in your family. I, I saw you when you were peeking on the internet and that you, that you were looking at things you shouldn't look at. I've seen you cheat. You dare to come against me, to cast me out? And most Christians would say, 
You're right. I have no ability whatsoever to be the one who says, come out of him, because I'm under the influence of demons as well. Here's the good news. Your power over demons was transferred to you by Jesus. And it has nothing to do with your holiness, with your abilities whatsoever. You have been given a name that is above everything named. And if you've got stuff going on, you can clean that up afterward. If I have a, a fireman that I need to put out a fire in my house, I don't care if he sinned the, the, yesterday morning. I don't care if he did something stupid on the way to the fire. Put the fire out. Christian, put the demons to flight. Get them out in the name of Jesus. It's his name, his power, not yours. And he is a holy powerful, mighty God who said, I've given you power and authority. Now you take care of it. You deal with them. You get rid of them. Amen. My brother and sister, in this hour that we're living in, right here in our county, in our schools, in our marketplace, <clears throat> I'm telling you right now by word of the Lord, I, we're just getting this in the nick of time <clears throat> because you have friends already being seduced. There are people in your life that are already being pulled aside, pulled aside, already being touched by the things that are going on out there. And you need to know who you are and what you're standing on. You need to know your foundation, and you need to know what authority that you have. And you might not be able to keep anyone free if they invite that stuff back in, but you can sure give them a moment to come to their senses and make a right decision to turn back to a living God. The attraction of the cults is to offer something fresh and new. You've never seen this before. And I want you to know that there's nothing that is more eternal, nothing more real than the kingdom of heaven, just the way that it was delivered to us. Yeah. And when we stand on that foundation, we have nothing to fear. Amen. And we move forward to set people free. Amen. Be emotionally equipped for the hard world encounters and you'll be a good disciple. Amen? Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Praise God. Father, we want to say thank you that as we uh, just finish a time of study today, that we realize the reality of spirit, the spiritual world, and we can't deny it. It's in the Scripture. The, the entire book of Acts, the Gospels are all caught up with the reality of demon powers. We are, we are told to go in your name and to, to affect to affect a, a good work, and that means that there are rigors ahead of us, things that we, we must be willing to accept, and we must regard, regard the spiritual world for what it is. And I thank you in Jesus' name that today we are more emotionally equipped than ever before to deal with the things coming against us. We recognize that there are powers at work right now, right here, that have lied to us, deceived us, telling us that we're nobody, that we can't be forgiven, that we, we can't move forward, that, that we're just too far gone. And it's absolutely a total and complete lie. Spirits work on deceptions, and I pray that today every deception would be lifted in this place and that every son and daughter would be willing to accept their responsibility for hard world encounters and spiritual warfare. Thank you so much, Lord. Get our eyes on the work you've given us to do and let us see who we are rightfully in Christ Jesus. You may be here today and maybe, maybe this is you I'm talking to, that you have never been free of demon powers. In your life, you felt like a ping pong ball your whole life being pushed around, finding yourselves in circumstances that you can't even believe that you got yourself into. And I want you to know you weren't alone. You weren't alone. Every one of us has an assignment against us, every single one. Every single one of us is the target of an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy the quality of life that God has for us. And the only way to get started in the right pathway is to come to salvation. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you the question, are you here today and say, Siri, I want to be born again. I want to be free. I want to know who I am. I, I want to be able to exercise it, my influence over, over darkness and to see light come into dark situations. I want to be born again. If that's you and you want to be born again, raise your hand anywhere in the auditorium. Anywhere at all. I want to be born again. I want to be saved. Seems like we're in a household of faith this morning. So just look at me. 
Right outside that door is a world begging for deliverance. And you know who's got the power? You got the power. <laughs> Get out there and set those people free. We love you. See you midweek for service time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye-bye.